hello everyone um let's see people have noticed that i've been wearing two masks this week and let me just say it's because um, when i'm in the workplace i've been vaccinated but because transmission is so rampant in the community our agency has gone back to requiring face masks for everyone indoors i've been wearing two masks this week because I've been spending a lot of time at our new pop-up clinic at the mall and occasionally I, you know, have to pitch in and help, you know, swab and test people for COVID. And in that setting, it's recommended that you wear an N95. I wear a cloth covering to protect the N95 and then we wear gowns, gloves and a face shield to, to collect, um, you know, swabs from the nose of people and there's so much you know, in the community, we have quite a few positives, so I'm doing my best to protect myself when I'm in that clinic setting. But in the office setting, um, we're still just wearing one. So um, I'm Rundy Murphy, epidemiologist and director of disease surveillance at the Mobile County Health Department. We're um, here today, Friday, August 6th, finally Friday, as Bailey Majors says. Um, and we're here to give you the COVID-19 update. So we are approaching 52,000 people, cumulative number of, of patients hot, or, um, with confirmed or probable COVID, diagnosed with COVID, sorry, I just ran in the building and ran in front of the camera. So 51,924 cumulative number of COVID-19 cases in Mobile County residents, 848 were reported to us yesterday. That is not a mistake. 848 reported yesterday. The total number of people who have died with COVID is 885. Eight additional deaths were recorded, reported to us yesterday. So we will see the highest number of deaths reported to us this week than we have seen in many months once we look at the week in retrospect um, on Monday. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The cumulative number of people hospitalized is 6,592. 45 people were hospitalized, admitted yesterday. Each day we've been seeing around 40 or 45 new hospitalizations each day. We just incredible um, number of cases and hospitalizations. And again, the overwhelming majority, greater than 90% of them occurring in unvaccinated people. Yesterday, there were 338 people hospitalized with COVID. That was down from 350 the day before, which of course was a record high. Um, outpaced the highest number that we had seen previously, which was in the middle of January. And again, COVID cases going up at an alarming rate, deaths increasing hospitalizations continuing to increase. And we will look again Monday at that percent positive to see if our percent positive is still about one in three or if it's gone up or down. I did want to mention just some internal data that we have been keeping a close eye on and people ask me about a lot. If we look at the hospitalizations by age group for the last two weeks, we see that of the folks that were hospitalized, there's usually around 250 or so, uh, 10 of them were less than 12 years old. So too young to be vaccinated. So it's running about five to 6% of all hospitalizations are in children who are less than 12 years old. We heard from University Hospital yesterday that out of the 20 pediatric intensive care unit beds that they have available, 19 of them were full. So this is affecting younger people, affecting people who are too young to get vaccinated. If we look at, you know, zero to 17 year, year olds, again, five to 7% on average. And then about 25% of all of the hospitalizations are between the age of 18 and 40. Again, it's not just older folks or those with underlying health conditions that are at requiring hospitalizations. 
It's unvaccinated people, some of them with no real, um, you know, um, diseases that might put them at risk of, of hospitalization. So, but remember, obesity is a high, is a, increases your risk of being hospitalized. Asthma increases your risk of being hospitalized with COVID. So a lot of time when we think of underlying health conditions, we thought, think about heart disease or liver disease or lung disease, but asthma, obesity, or, you know, being overweight, those those kinds of things can can put you at higher risk and those are we see those in younger populations also young people sometimes have undiagnosed you know high blood pressure so there are are multiple factors that would would cause a young person to require hospitalization getting covid and again it's almost completely avoidable by getting a covid vaccine becoming fully vaccinated these vaccines are 95% effective at preventing hospitalizations and deaths. So even if you think you're young and you're healthy and you don't need a vaccine, please reconsider. Please protect yourself and help us protect people that are too young to get vaccinated. Right now with school going back into session, we are expecting to see the number of cases in school-aged children to climb. We've already seen at least one school closure. We've seen some schools delaying the start of school because things are so bad right now. Some schools have reversed their decision and they are now requiring mask wearing for in-person learning. Schools need to put every layer of prevention measure measures that they have at their disposal, you need to put it in place now. Schools are going to continue to have trouble. Businesses are going to continue to struggle. We are going to see more business closures, school closures, outbreaks at congregate settings, outbreaks in churches. It's going to continue to happen, everyone. So please, uh, do everything that you can do, everything that you did last year this time, put it back into place so that we can try to slow the outbreak because we're just not going to be able to get enough people vaccinated fast enough. Explain the difference from 1A and 1B numbers. Okay. Someone asking what the difference between 1A figure and 1B figure. So 1A is the count when the case is reported to us. So that 848, those were reported to the health department yesterday. 1B is a date that gets as close to the infectious date as we can get. So really, and this is on the second page, infectious date, basically it's an algorithm that estimates the date a person was most likely infectious. And it's the earliest date among date of illness onset, specimen collection, or report to public health. So remember, the report date is easily influenced by things that have nothing to do with disease transmission, right? There can be backlogs of data. Maybe somebody is closed and they didn't enter, enter the data for yesterday and they, you know, have yesterday's and today's to enter today. So that report date is often influenced by things that have nothing to do with disease transmission. What we are trying to do with the infectious date is look, hopefully, look more at how disease is being transmitted in the community. And you'll notice that even though these numbers are low by comparison, like it takes us some time to figure out if they had illness onset, when their specimen was collection, collected, that sort of thing. So these, these recent days backfill. You'll see these numbers go up as, as we do the investigation or get in for more information. The report date is just an automated date stamp for the date that it's reported to us. So hopefully that answers that question. Thank you for asking. At least we know someone's looking at it. That's good news. Okay, uh, perhaps a little bit of, of good news. We have seen that the 
requests or people coming in for vaccine is increasing. It increased last week as compared to the week before. It's increasing this week. So far this week, the Mobile County Health Department has given around 600 vaccines. We And we still have today to tally and we have two events this weekend. So we will definitely have more vaccines given this week than we did last. So that's good news and I hope that that's happening all around the county at all of the locations that are still giving vaccine, largely pharmacies, provider offices, that sort of thing. The other thing this week, which I've reported on before, is that the Mobile County Health Department extended, provided extended COVID services to a third Monday through Friday location this week. So we had leased some space at the shops at Bel Air and we were working towards, you know, getting it with internet and with desks and with clinic space and make sure everything was working well, get the bathrooms um, updated and all of that. But we just felt because there was so much demand for testing that we needed to open that clinic as quickly as possible. So a week ago today, we met there with a rental company and got some, you know, chairs and tables and some, some other things that we needed to, to open a pop-up clinic. And we opened the clinic on Wednesday and we've had a really good turnout of, of people getting tested, the people coming to get vaccine. It seems to be going up. So I think yesterday at that location, we tested 248 people and gave around 60 something vaccines. I just left there a little after two o'clock to try to get here for Facebook Live. We had already given about 100 and had already tested about 150 people. I don't know how many vaccines they had given, but we're, we're seeing more people that test negative when we say, hey, uh, you just tested negative. Why don't you just walk right over there and have your choice of Moderna or Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson? And we really are excited when people say, okay, okay, I'll do it. So we're getting good feedback down there. It's more centrally located. It's a place that seems neutral. People know the mall. Um, so um, we're super happy that that seems to be working well for us. And we will continue to be there for as long as the community needs us. So again, no cost for vaccine or for testing. Walk in, no appointment necessary. We've gotten, someone asked me today, they were just so excited that they didn't have to wait two hours for a test. And, you know, they were like, really? There's no charge? And I said, no. And he said, well, is there a tip jar anywhere? <laughs> so we're just, it's really nice to get some good feedback um, about being there because our staff are, are really st stretched thin right now, but we're trying, that's why I've been out there helping um, test. So, um, you know, if, if they put me to, to use testing patients, we are really stretched thin. So happy to be down there. It's good, a good team. We have good teams everywhere. All right. The media questions. So someone says, do I think state political health leaders should make masking and vaccinations mandatory? So this is tricky we shouldn't have to make vaccines and mask wearing mandatory. We all know it works. Everyone knows that vaccines prevent infectious diseases, right? We don't have smallpox anymore. We don't have polio. We have very few measles, right? We diphtheria almost never, tetanus almost never, all of these things, we know vaccines work. We also learned last year when we had no COVID vaccine that wearing a mask works. Distancing works, washing your hands, staying at home when you're sick. All of those things helped us last year slow COVID transmission when it got to really high rates. We didn't have a vaccine. We had to rely on those things. So we know what works. We just have to do it. All right. Then a somewhat related question, given that it takes weeks to become fully vaccinated, could we slow the rise in cases and hospitalizations without mandates if we dramatically increase vaccination? So what this question is getting at 
If you take a J&J &J vaccine today, you will have full protection in two weeks. If you take Moderna today, you will have to have another shot in four weeks, and then it will take two more weeks for you to be fully protected. So that's a six week delay. If you get the Pfizer vaccine today, you'll have to wait three weeks to get your second shot and then two more weeks. So it will take you five weeks to become fully protected again, you know, with the Pfizer vaccine. So this delay anywhere from two to six weeks means that we are going to continue seeing a high number of cases and hospitalizations. That's just going to happen. What we need people to do is go ahead and get that first shot because you'll start building some immunity, right? That will provide you some protection. But we've got a lot of work to do before we have you know, more than 35% of our population vaccinated. A lot of work to do. It's not going to happen overnight. And that's why we have to right now add all of those layers of protection back into daily life. Because it's the only thing that's going to do that's that's going to help slow it. All right. Someone asking about the success of the clinic at the shops of Bel Air. We have been calling it COVID-21 because it's in the space formerly occupied by the clothing store Forever 21. So it is doing well. It's still a little rough around the edges. We're hoping we'll get the floors mopped and um, spiffied up this weekend, but it seems to be working really well. Please stop by if you need a test. Please go and get vaccinated. We will be there until 7 today and then reopen on Monday at 9. So, Facebook questions. All right. Someone asking about our downtown clinic has a main entrance, the only entrance, only public entrance. And when you, if you've been here, you walk in, Vital records is to the right where people need to get birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates. And the waiting room for COVID testing is to the left. And there has been such a demand for COVID testing, it sometimes gets a little congested in there. So recognizing that, we opened up a, a second enter, another entrance for staff. So staff can now come through an entrance that was previously closed. To, so we're doing that to try to decompress that, that entrance. And then we open the mall to try to decompress the traffic at our Keeler location. So we are doing the things that we can do to try to decompress the traffic coming in that main door. Unfortunately, we don't have another entrance for people coming to the clinic. It's just not in our footprint. So remember, when you come to a clinic, expect there to be sick people. So wear a mask, distance, and get vaccinated. Is the clinic set up in the mall going to be there for a while? I need my second vaccine. It'll be depending on a ride. Yes, we're going to be at the mall for as long as the community needs us to be there to provide COVID testing and COVID vaccine. So the only reason we will leave is if our customers dry up, if our supplies dry up, or if we don't have enough staff to run it. So we'll be looking for you down there to get your second shot. All right, someone asking if I know about local police, sheriff, firemen, vaccinated, that there are a, it, you know, there's a low percentage of first responders that are vaccinated. I don't have the details on that. When, again, the it, public safety would, would know. I, I don't have data on the vaccine coverage rates in first responders. Any plans for drive-by testing seems a safe option. The difficulty with drive-through testing is that it's summer and it's 95 degrees outside and there is a thunderstorm almost every day and you almost can never predict where a pop-up, you know, afternoon thunderstorm is going to happen. 
that makes it incredibly difficult for us to have drive-through testing or drive-through vaccine clinics the way we have sometimes done. So you will not see the health department returning to outdoor drive-through events for some time. We are just not able to do that in a dependable way. I have heard that there are some maybe clinics or pharmacies that have a drive-through, like maybe a drive-through pharmacy where they're doing, but that's like one line at a time. So I, we don't have something like a drive-up window at the health department. So unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity and doing it outside just does not make sense this time of year. Let's see. Is there a way to find out the number of cases per zip code? Kind of, sort of, not really. So according to the privacy rule, we can only provide data on the number of cases for zip codes that have at least 20,000 people in it. So on our weekly expanded report, we do show a zip code map of the rate, so the, uh, the population adjusted rate of people with COVID in the last two weeks. So that gives you a general idea about, you know, zip codes that have more cases than others, because again, that map is adjust, adjusted for the population of the zip code. Could it have been just all the 4th of July celebrations? Boy, I wish that we could blame it all on 4th of July, but 4th of July is now 35 days ago. And again, if it were just the 4th of July, we would have seen a leveling off of cases in about two weeks past the 4th of July. So we are now about five weeks past the 4th of July. It is not just the 4th of July. It's low vaccination rates. It's Delta variant, much more highly infectious. It's not as enough people wearing masks and not enough people distancing. And people not staying at home when they're supposed to. They're not isolating. They're not quarantining. They think it doesn't apply to them. They're tired of hearing me say that. <laughs> so that is what has us in this mess. And it's going to take a lot of work to get us out of it. But we can do it. We just need more people to get vaccinated and we need you to wear your masks and distance. All right. Healthcare worker who was vaccinated around December, January. Wearing a map, blah, 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 blah. Okay. This is basically asking if, you've, if it's been six, seven, eight months since you got vaccinated, how protected, can, how, how protected are you? Do you need to take extra measures? And yes, you do. We have not seen FDA and CDC suggest that booster doses are needed. They are talking to the manufacturers, looking at the data in the clinical trials, and what they are seeing so far, they have said that a third dose or a boost isn't necessary at this time, that the protection from your first, prime, what's called a primary series, so two doses of Pfizer, two doses of Moderna, or one dose of J&J, &J, the primary series is sufficient to protect you for now. But if we were like we were in June, when we had 3% positive, 10 or 15 people in the hospital, I would say if you're fully vaccinated, enjoy your life as if it were pre-pandemic, but not now. Now we have record numbers of cases, record numbers of hospitalizations, record number of percent positive. Everybody, vaccinated or not, should be adding prevention measures. Everyone should wear a mask indoors. If you are vaccinated, and you have underlying health conditions or immunocompromised, you should wear a mask and distance everywhere. We've got to put those back in place. Again, every business, every workplace, every group, every community center, every agency should be implementing additional layers of protection 
now. Should have done it a week or two ago, but do it now because it is not going to get better anytime soon. Can my 10 year old get vaccinated? No ma'am or no sir. Right now, only 12 and over are authorized to get vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. I think I already answered the question that if you got vaccinated early on, yes, vaccines are still holding their own. So some questions about the what people are starting to call, <clears throat> excuse me, Delta Plus or Delta Two. So I talked a little bit about this last night at an event that I went to at a church in Grand Bay. And thanks a lot <laughs> to the the um, the Fernland group who hosted us there. We there are sort of three um, three versions of the Delta variant and. CDC and others are looking to see if there are any differences in the three versions of the Delta variant. Are there differences with regard to infectiousness or symptoms or, you know, vaccine effectiveness that might make them want to split out the, the three Delta variants into a different category? They've not done that yet, but we're starting to see a little bit about that in the news and in social media. So stay tuned, maybe next week, I'll be able to provide you with a little bit more clarity on the three versions of Delta. What, when people ask me about this, like, what do you mean three versions of Delta? And I say, well, it's kind of like an azalea, right? You've got white ones, you have light pink ones, you have dark pink ones, have some that look like maybe they're red. That's what I mean. So it's a, a Delta variant, but slightly different versions of it, just like you have slightly different versions of an azalea. Let's see. How long from exposure does it take to show symptoms? Wow, we've been answering this question since March of 2020. I'm gonna answer it again for you. For normal COVID, if you are exposed and get infected, on average, it takes 5.1 5 to 5 .1 days for you to develop symptoms, but it can range from one to 10 days. I'm sorry, from two to 14 days. So if you're exposed and you get infected, on average, it's around five days. It can be as early as two and as long as 14 days. That's why we do 14 days of quarantine for people who are exposed. With the Delta variant, what I'm hearing is that, I'm not seeing a lot of data on it, but what my respected colleagues are saying is that Delta, because it's so infectious that it replicates much faster and you could get sick faster. So we still ask you to quarantine for 14 days or, or discontinue it 10 days if you have no symptoms, but you may see people with the Delta variant get sick sooner after exposure than parent COVID that took approximately five days. And then the last question that we rolled over from yesterday is about homebound vaccinations. And we were able to, the Mobile County Health Department was able to do homebound vaccinations when we had the support of the National Guard. But once they were demobilized, when the statewide emergency declaration ended, we have not been able to continue our, you know, in-home vaccine efforts. I hope that we may be able to get back to this at some point, but it's it's not going to happen soon. What I would encourage you to do is talk to your home health agency and ask them to help you get vac vaccinated. We may be able to assist by, if they don't have COVID vaccine, um, we may be able to assist them by you know, helping them get access to the vaccine so that they could vaccinate you when they come into your home. Most homebound patients, you know, have oxygen delivered or they have someone that comes and checks on them. There are other things, you know, in-home rehab or respiratory care, respiratory therapy. So there, most people who are homebound do have some healthcare service delivered to them. So talk to that agency and see if they can help you. Have them reach out to us 
if they would be willing to give vaccine, but they don't currently have it. And we'll figure out if there's a way that we can partner with them to get them some doses to bring to you. Okay, Mark, a lot of questions. Are there any common themes? Sorry, Mark's what, saying there are so many questions we may have to one, wait till Monday. At what, uh, can anyone who wants a COVID test get one at the mall regardless of symptoms? Yes, you don't need symptoms. You don't need to have, we, lots of people have been coming in for different reasons, like they need a negative test to go to work or, you know, they, something, their school's asking them for it. They've been exposed and, you know, they need to know if, if they have COVID yet. So you do not need symptoms. You don't need an insurance card. You don't need, we touch, there's no age limit. Um, we've seen large families come in and everybody wants to get tested. And so we're trying to test as many people as we can because testing is a measure to prevent the spread of COVID because you, when you may be spreading it and don't know it, today, the last person that I saw before I came out here, um, a, a child about eight years old was brought in by his grandmother. Both of his parents had COVID, <laughs> so they sent the child to stay with the grandmother. So the grandmother brought in the, the child, the child has COVID. The grandmother's exposed. So I say to grandmother, you need to get tested before you leave here. Doesn't mean you can avoid quarantine, but you need to get tested. She says, well, let me call my husband. He's in the car. Maybe he can get tested too. Yes, ma'am. Bring them in and let's get them tested. I mean, it's just amazing the stories that are coming into the front door about, you know, well, my friend went to a baseball camp in Georgia and we think he got it there and then we had a sleepover and I think that's where I got it and then I get it's just crazy it's just everywhere so no you don't need symptoms to come get tested for COVID at any of our clinics anything else Mark um, one um, please clarify the quarantine guidelines schools and employers were stating that vaccinated do not have to quarantine if exposed to COVID. All right. So we had been saying that fully vaccinated people did not have to quarantine if they were exposed to COVID. And some things have changed. What we are saying now is if you're fully vaccinated, that you should do a couple of things if you're exposed. You should get tested three to five days after exposure and then every three to five days, you should wear a mask, right? But you don't necessarily have to go home. And I will double check that that is true and talk about this again on Monday because I was on a call this morning at 8.30. The Alabama Department of Public Health has updated their quarantine and isolation guidance for, non, for regular people and also for healthcare personnel. And so I think I have it right, but I will double check this and we'll talk about this again on Monday. Okay. All right. With that, I'm going to um, end today's Facebook Live update. Um, have a safe weekend. Don't forget, get vaccinated. Um, stay at home if you're sick. Stay safe, everybody. And we'll talk to you again next week.